Good morning, First Pilgrim Calvary. I um, want to welcome you to our online word broadcast once again. Thank you for all of you who have consistently and faithfully supported um, all of us as we attempt to continue to bring you the message and the good news of Jesus Christ even during um, such times in which we are existing. Um, I'm appreciative um, once again of the entire leadership of your church as well as you all, um, all of you who are congregants and members that make up this great ministry um, for allowing us this opportunity to continue to come to you um, despite these times. We pray that this has continued um, to be a blessing to you. Um, we pray that um, all of the messages that have been going forward, all of the teachings that have been going forward are um, blessing you tremendously um, and uplifting you um, in the times in which we are existing. Um, let's open with a word of prayer before we get into our Sunday school lesson on today. Eternal Father, we come now to say thank you. We come thanking you for this day. We come thanking you for this opportunity um, just to assemble, um, even virtually, God, um, to come together to um, worship you through um, your word on today. Now, God, as we prepare to enter our Sunday school lesson, we ask, God, that you would open our minds, that we would um, be able to thank um, Father God, uh, open our ears that we will hear in the spirit, open our hearts that we will receive what you have for us to say, uh, hear on today and receive on today. And when it's all said and done, we'll be ever so careful to give you all the praise, all the glory and all the honor. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. We have a good lesson on today. Um, this morning's lesson is found in the book of Judges, the Old Testament book of Judges, um, the sixth chapter. Um, and we begin reading at verse number 11. We'll read verses 11 through 24. Today we're talking about the call of Gideon. Um, one of my favorite lessons um, in the Bible, um, the call of Gideon. Gideon um, the, uh, Gideon's call is a perfect picture of many of our calls to ministry, um, many of our calls um, to discipleship on today. So I believe that we'll be able to relate to it. And not just his call, but um, as we look at the times in which Gideon lived and the time in which he was called and the circumstances that he was called to, um, we'll see a perfect picture of our world on today. So the call of Gideon, the book of Judges, chapter number six, verse uh, verses 11 through 24. Um, just to give some historical background of our text on today, um, we, we see that uh, uh, we are dealing with the Israelites. The Israelites are given um, over to the uh, Midianites as a result of their evil. Um, we find that um, in previous verses that um, the Israelites have dealt with captivity before. They've dealt with um, situations and issues similar to this before. Um, uh, they find themselves in a position where nothing they are able to do prospers. Um, they, their, their entire, uh, or, or should I say, they, nothing that they did um, was able to prosper to their benefit. Um, everything that they did, um, the Easterners uh, came in and ruined their livestock, their, li their, their way of living. Um, so, 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 so uh, they find themselves in a position where they are yet again calling out to the Lord. They found themselves in the midst of a, 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 a of a bondage situation, uh, in the midst of captivity, calling out to the Lord yet again, um, and reminding you that these are the same children of Israel that were enslaved in Egypt. Um, they were they were enslaved in Egypt, but we know the story of how Moses led them out of captivity. Um, um, but but now they find themselves as a result of evil, um, in in another predicament um, that is not to their advantage. Um, so, so we find that they, uh, in this particular context on today, just giving this to you to put the, the whole situation into perspective, they, um, find themselves in a situation where they are crying out to God to send, uh, to, to, to send them, um, out, to get them out, to bring them out of this situation, out of, um, uh, uh, uh deliver them from the hands of the Midianites and all of the, um, other Easterners. Um, and, and we find initially that their, their cries are answered by unnamed prophet. Um, and as we look at the earlier verses in our text, they are answered by, um, they're, 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 they're given an answer from God by an unnamed prophet. Um, and, and this prophet tells them, he, 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 he actually gives us more insight. As we see the, the unnamed prophet comes in, he gives us some more insight as to what's going on, why the children of Israel, why the Israelites find themselves at the hands uh, or at the mercy of the Midianites. Um, one of the main issues that the prophet, um, the unnamed prophet sheds light on is idolatry. 
um, where they have they have participated in worshiping other gods. Um, and God had already warned them about that. Um, he had already warned them that that they shouldn't do that once they got to this new land, once they got to this new area, they should not um, fall subject or fall victim to the idolatry that was going on in the land already. So um, then we, we, we are met by a man named Gideon. Um, um, we, we will find um, some more insight on Gideon. So as we open up our Sunday school books, um, um, once again, the, the, the title of our lesson is The Call of Gideon. Um, taken from Judges 6, 11 through 24, as we look at our introduction, um, as God's people, we are among those who are the called according to his purpose. That's a reference back to Romans 8 and 28, where Paul said that all things work together for the good of them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. Um, so, so, so one of the questions I want you to keep in mind as we go through our lesson on this morning is what does it mean to be called according to God's purpose? Let's keep that question in mind. What, what does it mean to be called according to his purpose? Um, we are also called the saints um, with all that in every place um, called upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, taken from 1 Corinthians 1 and 2. Beyond our call to salvation, some are called to specific areas of ministry and service. So beyond being saved, brothers and sisters, I, I had a... a Old pastor, I heard say once that that God does not call us to be just pew men, uh, members, um, but he's called us to do something more. Um, now, now that's for us to decipher. That's for us. That's between you and God, what, what you are called to do. But but some of us are beyond our call to salvation are called to specific areas of ministry and service. Some are called to be ushers. Some are called to be deacons. Some are called to be deaconess. Some are called to sing in the choir. Some are called to be musicians. Some are called to be missionaries. So we, we all have a different calling um, in one way of, uh, or another. So it was under the old covenant, Israel. Um, Israel was called to a unique role in the world, but some Israelites were called to serve the Lord in specific ways. However, not all those who were called were anxious to do what God asked them to do. And, and, and I believe that's a perfect thing to relate to our times on today, brothers and sisters, because um, um, one of the things that I find that if you talk to anybody that's been called to do something in the vineyard, anybody that's been called to work for God, they can tell you that they, they didn't just jump at the opportunity to do so. Amen. So, 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 so when Moses was called at the burning bush. He offered numerous excuses for not responding to God's summons. That can be found and cited in Exodus 3 and 1 um, through chapters 4 and verse 17. When Jeremiah was called to be a prophet, he protested that he was too young. I can relate to that. Um, as for Jonah, he fled from the Lord. So, so we, we, see, uh, we see all throughout the word of God uh, a stunning comparison with, with individuals that have been called to do God's work, that they didn't immediately, they were not immediately attracted to the work that God was calling them to do. Because one of the things I can tell you about ministry is that no matter whether you're a preacher, a pastor, no matter whether you're a minister, a min missionary, a deacon, usher, no matter what, if you are serious about God's work, anybody that can tell, anybody in, in a position of ministry can testify that it's not uh, glamorous. It's not all pompous. It's not all that, that we, we, we make it out to be. So, so, so many people, many, many, it, it's all throughout the word of God, that, 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 and not just in the word, throughout the word of God, but even in our churches today, that no one um, jumps at the opportunity to, to, to do this work. Um, so, 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 so these people, they fled from God. They gave excuses. They, 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 they protested. In contrast, others willingly, willing, willingly responded to God's call. So, so uh, a, a prime example is Isaiah. I, Isaiah responded by declaring, here I am, Lord, send me. In the New Testament, the four fishermen answered Christ's call, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Our lesson focused, focus, uh, our, our lesson focused Gideon was one of those who balked at the first, uh, at first at God's call, something which many of us might be able to identify. So our lesson outline provides us with four um, different parts. First being Gideon's doubt, then it being Gideon's reassurance, then number three being Gideon's gift um, to the angel, and finally Gideon's worship, uh, Gideon's worship to the Lord. So uh, as we get into Gideon's doubt, um, Judges 6 and 11, Judges 6 and 11, as we read, and there came um, an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, um, which was an Ophrah that pertained uh, unto Joash and uh, Abizir, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Abizirite, 
I and his son Gideon thresh wheat by the wind by the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. So um, right now, actually, we find that uh, Gideon is already working. And one of the things uh, one of the things I always talk about in Sunday school is that it's important that we not just get so caught up in the the uh, the plot that we miss the power. That we don't get so we don't get so caught up in just knowing the story that we miss the significance. So one of the things that um, I find, brothers and sisters, is that when you are working for God, usually God is looking for people who are willing workers. When he's looking for someone to do this work in ministry, like I said, whether you are an usher, whether you are a deacon, whether you are uh, on the board of trustees, the board of directors, or whatever the case may be, God is looking for willing workers. Um, God is looking for people who are, are, are not afraid to get their hands dirty. And that's what we find here in this 11th verse that Gideon is actually at work. He's at work by the wine press trying to hide um, the resources from the Midianites. Um, verse 12 says, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Now here we come, here, here's, here comes the doubt. Here comes the, the, the conflict. And I believe that this is going to be relatable to so many people on today um, as we look at the, 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 the condition our world is in today. Uh, uh, so, so the Lord can't, the, the angel comes to Gideon and tells him, look, the Lord is with you, thy mighty man of valor. And then Gideon says, Gideon's response says, oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us of saying, did the Lord not bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. So he's saying, look, OK. I, I, I hear what you're saying, Angel. I, I, I hear what the Lord is trying to tell you, but 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 it seems kind of contradictory that you telling me that God is with me, that you're basically trying to tell me that God has something for me to do, but yet I I, I find myself and my people in the midst of another bondage situation. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. I understand that this is the same God that brought us up out of Egypt before. But 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 that's not what I'm 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 concerned about right now. What I'm trying to figure out is that if He did it before, where is He right now? Doesn't that sound like us today, brothers and sisters? That even as we as we look at the midst of our uh, the, as we look at the condition of our world as it relates to this pandemic, as we look at our world as our uh, uh, as, as it relates to our people, uh, uh, our African American family constantly having to deal with police brutality, uh, having to deal with social injustice and inequality. Lord, I understand you've done it before, but we find ourselves in the position yet again. So so Gideon is saying, you know. When is enough enough? And the Lord looked upon him, verse number 14, and the Lord looked upon him and said, go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent, sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am least in my father's house. So, 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 so now, not only is uh, not only does the condition of um, the the of his people uh, uh, cast doubt on Gideon, but his personal condition. He's saying, "Look, do you not know that I'm not the richest man? I, I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not great in in social stat, uh, status. So, so how is it that the Lord is calling me?" But here's one, one powerful point I want you to take from the life of Gideon on today. I want you to take this. Write it down. Uh, 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 God uses ordinary people to fulfill extraordinary purposes. God will use ordinary people from ordinary backgrounds, from ordinary situations to fulfill extraordinary purposes. That's the reality for Gideon on today. So first, first, as we live with Gideon's, uh, Gideon's doubt on today, we, we are met with three uh, with three aspects of his of uh, uh, that that contribute to his doubt. First of all, is concealment. Concealment in, in, in the verses prior to this week this week's lesson, uh, uh, we learned that Israel once again did evil in the sight of the Lord. That's found in verse one. And for seven years was oppressed by Midian, uh, uh, <clears throat> like like a number, 
uh, of Israel's enemies, the Midianites were distantly related to them, though, uh, I mean, through one of uh, Abraham's children. Because of Midian's attacks in the land, Israel was greatly impoverished. So they find themselves in the midst of what, the, what, what, what this particular um, um, commentator describes as a, a period of concealment. They've been concealed because they find themselves in bondage yet again. Because of evil, they find themselves in bondage yet again. Because of this oppression, the, the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites. In response, God sent them an unnamed prophet to remind them of the Lord's goodness towards them in verses 8 through 10. And that in spite of his goodness, that, uh, uh, that they had disobeyed God. Consequently, the Lord had allowed them to be oppressed by Midian. God nevertheless planned to deliver Israel from Midian. He always has a plan, brothers and sisters, despite our uh, our situation on today, despite the oppressive um, condition of our world today. Can I tell you that God still has a plan for deliverance, that God still has a plan to bring us up out of bring us from the hand of our oppressors. He has a plan to bring us out of the, uh, the oppression of COVID-19, the oppression of police brutality, the oppression uh, of social injustice and inequality. God still has a plan despite our disobedience, despite uh, our oppression. Uh, 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 Ophrah was a city uh, in the fertile uh, Jezreel Valley in northern Israel near the border of Manasseh. So, so, so they dealt with, with, with concealment as a result of their disobedience. God told them. Hey, don't fall subject to, to worshiping these, these idol gods. Don't fall subject to, to, to participating in, the, in, in idol worship. But because they did, they found themselves in bondage, yet again at the hands of the Midianites. So now after their concealment, as a result, as a result of their concealment, now they have a complaint. Now, now they have a complaint in verses 12 through uh, 13 In verses 12 through 13. It says it was while Gideon was threshing wheat that an angel of the Lord appeared to him concerning uh, uh, um, concerning the identity of his heavenly uh, uh, of this heavenly being. There has been much discussion as seen in the account of Moses is called the angel of the Lord is used um, interchangeably with the Lord himself. So, so that's meant much debate whether or not it was an angel, whether it was the Lord himself, but, but really, truthfully, that's irrelevant. All we know is that regardless of who it was speaking, it was a message from God himself. So God can't, God appears, God appears to him in, uh, to Gideon in some way, shape or form to let him know that the first words, the first words spoken by the angel should have been reassuring to Gideon, but they were not. As far as Gideon was concerned, it did not appear as though God was with him or his people. So Gideon's complaint, Gideon's uh, conflict is that how is it that the Lord is speaking to me, but it seems that he's nowhere to be found in the midst of what we're going through. And for somebody out there today, somebody watching here today, the Lord has been moving you to another level in ministry. God has been calling you to do something in the church. He's been calling you to do something in his vineyard. But to you, you're trying to figure out, Lord, how is it that you're calling me to do something, but our churches are closed? How, how are you calling me to do something, but our people are dying? How, how is it that you're calling me to do something, but it seems as though you have abandoned us? And can I tell you on today, that doesn't matter how much you try to act like you got it all together. I can tell you that from, from even from a ministerial standpoint, there are times where it seems as though God is nowhere to be found. There are times in our lives where we will find ourselves with like Israel, where as a result of our concealment, we find ourselves with a complaint. So, 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 so that, 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 that's Gideon's, that's actually, that, that's Israel, Israel's complaint uh, is given to us through Gideon. That it seems that God is nowhere to be found. So how is it that you're calling me? How is it that you're asking me? How, how is it that you're sending me to do something? But, but after, after uh, uh, Gideon's concealment, after his complaint, he's given the commission. God, God, is a God, that, God is a God that will not take no for an answer. When God is calling you to do something, when God is, 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 is uh, uh, sending you to do his work, it does not matter what your complaint is. God says that despite your complaint, I'm still giving you a commission. 
So the commission is found in verses 14 and 15. As in Exodus um, 3, the angel of the Lord is identified with the Lord himself. He commands Gideon to go in the strength he had and promise that he would be God's instrument for deliverance for Israel. The, uh, this was not something Gideon initiated. He was being sent by Israel's God. Therefore, he could not fail. Can I tell you on today some good news? The good news on today is that despite um, the condition of the world, despite the issues surrounding us of the day, despite, you th despite what you think and you don't have, you cannot fail at doing what God has sent you to do. Oh, my, my, my. I, I, I know I'm not preaching here on today, but that's good news for somebody. Because you've been wondering, how am I going to make it through all of this? How am I going to get through all of this? How am I going to do what the Lord is sending me to do? God is saying, the good news is that you don't need much. All you need is what I've given you. And that's what God is saying on today to Gideon. Gideon, Gideon appealed to the low status of his family as an excuse uh, uh, for not responding to God's call. Look, God, look, 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 God, I don't have all this. I, I, I don't have the social status. I don't have the money. I don't have the, the resources. I don't have all these things that, that there are many other people you can be calling. There's no way you calling me. But God is saying that God is not concerned with, 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 with what you have, but he's concerned about what he's able to give you. Amen. While the Bible reveals that God sometimes used people of high standard to accomplish his purpose more often than not. He used people who might not be seen, who, who might be seen as the least likely to succeed. So God gave Gideon, God, 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 God gives us concealment. He gives us Gideon's complaint, but then he gives us commission. But now we are led to Gideon's reassurance. Let's look at verse 16. Verse 16 says, and the Lord said unto him, surely I will be with thee and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. He said, look, you're not going to need all this. You're not going to need an army. You're not going to need much. He says, you're going to smite them all by yourself. That's the type of power God has given Gideon on today. And he said unto him, if now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee and bring forth my present and set it before thee. And he said, I will tarry. Until thou come again. So success. So so now we are given three three more areas. Uh, uh, three three areas of, of Gideon's reassurance. First we're given his success. Then we're given a sign. Uh, uh, we're given success. Then we're given a sign. So, so, so first of all success. As rooted in verse uh, 16. Responding to Gideon's obvious doubts. Especially in his own abilities. God reassured the reluctant deliverer. That neither he nor the nation had been forsaken. The promise to Gideon. Surely I will be with thee. Is one that all true believers should cling to. Can I tell you that you should not be afraid. In going into what God has called you. You should not be worried. You should not be anxious because the reality is that God has given us a promise to cling to that he shall be with us. I'm reminded of the old song. He says, hold to God's unchanged hand. And in that verse, uh, uh, in that song, there's a verse that says, if by earthly friends forsaken, uh, still more closely to him cling. That, that this is a promise that we can cling on that no matter what happens to us, God says that he is with us despite uh, the circumstances surrounding us. Uh, 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 can I tell you that trouble often occurs when we take our eyes off the Lord and start focusing on the storm that is around us. But but we are we are comforted. We are comforted by the word of God that says he's low. He's with us always that he promises that he'll never leave us, nor will he ever forsake us. So, so it, it is one thing to know that the Lord is with us in troubling circumstances, but it is another thing to note that God will be uh, that with God we will always be victorious. In Gideon's situation, victory was assured. Um, the Midianites would be defeated as one man. That is, as if they were one man, not as a vast army that they constituted. As the, described earlier, the Midianites came as grasshoppers for multitudes, but uh, 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 for for both. They are, uh, for they and their camels were without number. So then we're given a sign. Gideon was still not convinced 
despite assured success, God gave him assured success that, look, your reassurance can know in that can come in knowing that, look, I promise you that you will succeed. But success wasn't enough for him. So 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 he asked for a sign. Verse 17 and 18, Gideon was still not convinced that uh, uh, that 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 what the angel promised was going to actually occur because his faith was weak. He asked for a sign. He asked for a sign. At this point, Gideon was seemingly having doubts that uh, this really was an angel of the Lord speaking. It is not clear when Gideon realized he was in the presence of a divine being. Sometime later, Gideon asked for two additional signs to be revealed through a fleece. This was later, uh, th this, this later account is used by some as a model for discerning God's will today. God, Gideon asked the angel to remain there while he prepared a present in verse 18. That is an offering for him in angelic appearance, in, uh, appearances in scriptures. Heavenly messages do not often linger once they have been delivered their message. This is somewhat different, however, as the angel said, I will tarry until thou come again. So now uh, we, we look at uh, Gideon's gift to the angel. Verse 19 says, and Gideon went in and made ready a king and unleavened cakes of flour. The flesh he put in the basket and he put uh, uh, put the broth in the plot and brought it out uh, unto him, unto the oak and presented it to him. And the angel of God said unto him, take the flesh and the unleavened cakes and lay them upon this rock and pour out the broth. And he did so. The angel of the Lord put forth the end of his staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes. And there rose a fire uh, out of the rock. And consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes and the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. So now we have a sacrifice and then we're given splendor. Sacrifice, verse 19, Gideon prepared a common animal sacrifice a young, of a young goat. Along with the meat, Gideon took a, a large quantity of flour and made some unleavened bread for his heavenly visitor. But then we're given splendor in verses 20 and 21, probably much to the surprise of Gideon. The angel instructed him to place the meat and the bread upon this rock, possibly part of the wine press. The, uh, while Gideon may have expected the angel to consume the offering, something unanticipated was about to occur in Gideon's presence. So we're about to give uh, uh, Gideon is about to give even more, more, more confirmation for what was happening. When the angel touched the offering, something amazing happened. Fire, consumed, fire came from the rock and consumed what Gideon had prepared. If Gideon was expected them to have conversation over dinner, that wasn't going to happen. The fiery uh, cons consumption of the meat and bread indicated the acceptance of Gideon's offering. So, so, so he lets them know basically to confirm that, look, I'm not just any other uh, being. But I, I, I've come to you with a divine purpose. Uh, and, and this has yet given him a uh, 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 confirmation for what he's looking for. So now Gideon prepares to worship the Lord in verse 22, verse 22 through 24. Uh, he he worships God and he gets two things. He gets perception and then he gets peace. He gets perception in verse 22 with all the sudden with the sudden departure of the angel, either by ascending into heaven or simply disappearing, doesn't really state. Gideon was now convinced that he had been in the presence of a divine messenger. So now he has a confirmation. Uh, uh, this lends support to the view that the angel had appeared to, gain, to Gideon incognito, basically hidden. Coming to uh, the awareness brought great uh, 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 bait confirmation to Gideon. As stated earlier, the presence of the angel was equivalent to the presence of the Lord himself. That being so, this was usually interpreted as an uh, ominous sign, possibly a deadly one. As God told Moses, that shall no man see me and live. This, this no doubt is a reason Isaiah uh, thought his days were numbered as uh, after having a vision of God on his throne in the, uh, in, in the sixth chapter of Isaiah. We, of course, know God through his son, 
that no man has seen, uh, no man has seen God at any time, the only begotten of the Son, which is the bosom of the Father, ha he has declared and revealed to himself. So, so, so he has, he has been given perception, and now as a result of his perception, he's given peace. Verses 23 and 24. Uh, exactly how God, how, how the Lord spoke to Gideon is not stated, but he made it clear to Gideon his life would be preserved so he should not have to fear. Like many before him, Gideon erected an altar to the Lord and worshiped God. This was both symbolic that he had uh, uh, of what had occurred and represented a renewed commitment to serve the Lord. So now Gideon has what he needs to go on his way. Can I give you some encouragement from the life of Gideon on today? Some encouragement on today is that if uh, 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 is that it, it is time, brothers and sisters, that we take the time to hear from God, that we take to God, take to take the time. To, to really pray and seek God's face during this time that we will be make sure that we are in that we are within the will that he has for our lives. And, and, and I'm, I promise you, my brothers, I promise you, my sisters, that God is able, that God is willing to show himself to you in one way or another and confirm to you what it is that he is telling you in a time such as this. Can I tell you that certainly now is the time that we take that we acknowledge that the harvest is great. But the laborers are few. Eternal Father, we come once again to say thank you. We come against, uh, again to praise you and worship you for your word. We come thanking you, Father God, for your commission. We come thanking you, God, that you are, still in call, you are still calling your people, even in times such as this. I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice, God, that you would show yourself to them. Show them what you would have, to do, to have them to do. Show them where you would have them to serve. And I believe, Father God. That when we return, Father God, when we are able to gather one once again, God, that there will be a revival like never before. That there will be come, there will uh, be a, a, a folk coming asking, "What must they do to be saved?" That there will be folk coming asking, Father God, are uh, ready and willing to serve you in your vineyard. And when it's all said and done, God will be ever so cautious, ever so careful to give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Once again, my brothers and my sisters, thank you for tuning in on today. I'm praying for you as you prepare to go and um, fellowship um, uh, 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 in, in the word uh, on today and receive your gospel message on today. I'm praying that God will continue to enlighten your minds, that he will continue to encourage your hearts as we make it through such turbulent times in which we are existing. God bless you. God keep you as our prayer. I'll be praying for you and with you that God will continue to sustain you in the days and weeks to come. God bless.